Hello, and thanks for joining us today here on the Happiness Quest. My name is Jess Dutel from the Center for Business and Community Partnerships at Plymouth State University and from the PEMU Center, thanks to our service learning partnership. And I'm Dr. Maria Sanders, a philosophy professor over at Plymouth State University and the CEO for Philosophy for Life. And on today's program, we're going to focus on the question of whether or not money can buy happiness. And I thought, what better way to start than to look at this thing we call money. Yes. Uh, so I've got a few things for us to take a look Some at. Some props, okay. This first one, very common, the $1 bill. Uh, probably one of the most common bills, but maybe not in this fashion, where it's in a sheet. Uh, have you seen these printed out? I haven't. This is my first time seeing them. Okay. Yeah, this is actually f directly from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Uh, who prints our money in Washington, D.C. for us. And you got your hands on one. I have my hands on one, but this actually is already cut. Mm -hmm. uh, can you guess how many $1 bills they would print on a single sheet? Oh, my goodness. So much more than four. Uh, a lot more than four. 50? You're right. You're really? right. It used to be 32. So excited. Yeah, but now it's 50. And, and we so don't practice that. No, we did. You got that right over there. <laughs> Um, but it's interesting because we were talking last time about moderation mm -hmm. and finding that point of balance. And even with printing money, uh, there's a point of balance. Uh, if you think about how inflation and deflation mm -hmm. works, if they print too much money, it inflates the value. So basically, we get less for our mm -hmm. dollar. So we can see where that's not a good thing. Right. But we may not think so much about if they print too little money. That sounds like a good thing. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, well, then my dollar's worth more. I can buy more. But that's actually not a good thing either uh, because what happens, people start to hold on to the actual dollar right. rather than putting it into investments or purchasing things. So the value yeah. becomes, rather than an right. instrument or a tool, but in the thing itself, yeah. the value becomes there. Yeah. So as we think about whether or not this can actually buy happiness, you know, can this make me happy? Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to think about how we take particular pieces of paper and give them additional value exactly. that they just didn't have right. prior to that. And that is ingrained in us from childhood, it our is. beliefs about money. Yeah. And I wanted to share just a quick story because last weekend we went to the stores in Tilton. We were going to the outlets and we were in one of the stores and my five-year-old saw a sweater. Now the sweater was $30 and I said, sweetheart, you know, let's go look at the clearance rack <laughs> and look at all these beautiful items you can get from $2 to $5. How exciting is that? But she wanted this $30 sweater. And of course, she's going to outgrow it in a month, right? right? So yeah. it just wasn't worth it. And trying to explain to her the value in that. And she said, but mama, you can use your card and then you don't have to pay any money. Well, and that's interesting. <laughs> when I think of the credit cards, I can remember my oldest son when he was about eight. Mm -hmm. uh, Christmas time was coming around, and they're making their Christmas list, and he finished really quickly. Mm -hmm. He came, and he had one item on it. He wanted a credit card. Yeah. <laughs> because he had figured out right. that you could just take this card and get anything you and want. So you all the toys. And, <laughs> yeah. and so, yeah, the whole credit thing, it takes a little longer, I think, yeah. for them to understand how that credit works. You're still going to have to yeah. pay for yeah. it. Yeah. We had a little conversation about that. But, yeah, she thought she had the solution. Well, and it is interesting when you think about, like, things being put on sale. You know, the value of that dollar and what it can purchase. The right. dollar itself isn't always driving that. Sometimes it's on the exactly. product side, you know, yep. what drives it. Um, so this one's my favorite, uh, the $2 bill. Uh, these are actually still produced, and they're mm -hmm. still in circulation, although they're much less common mm -hmm. than the $1 bill. Uh, the $2 bill, if you wanted to get these today, you'd probably have to order them at yep. your bank. Mm -hmm. uh, but we always use them frequently for tipping yeah. uh, because it had a uniqueness to it. Oh, absolutely. And it has a unique history uh, behind it as well yeah. uh, because these were actually originally produced uh, for the security of the country. Mm -hmm. And they were taken out of circulation for a while, and that's why they're quite rare now. Um, even though they have started producing them again, they don't produce them anywhere near in the quantity that, say, right. the ones or the fives or the tens. The tooth fairy brings twos to our house. Well, they have a, I, I hear a direct connection yeah. with the $2 <laughs> bill. Yeah, they do it on house. see them too. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Although at times they'd rather the tooth fairy knew the $5 bill yeah. than the two, but they know the $2 bill. <laughs> well, how about this one? This is, again, looks like a $1 bill. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a closer inspection of it. Anything unusual or unique about 
Well, the blue seal. Yeah, if we look back at, well, this is the two. Let me grab the one here. If we look back at the $1 bill and put that one up alongside of it, one thing that jumps out is the color difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll also notice at the very top up here, the top of this one, it just says Federal Reserve Note. This is a silver certificate. It's a silver certificate. And again, these are unique because the silver certificates uh, were actually produced in response to the Western silver mining interest. They were upset that uh, the United States was backing all their currency with gold. gold. And so originally, you could turn these back in and redeem them for actual silver. And it was in the government vaults. Can't do that anymore. Um, but they have become quite rare because, again, they've been taken out of circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't print steadily, uh, although they were brought back into the printing scheme uh, for the bicentennial in 1976. Um, but beyond that, uh, they printed for a while. You cannot redeem them for silver anymore. They've become more of a collector's mm -hmm. item um, than anything. And we usually don't spend the, the silver certificates, um, although you could. Uh, it would spend like a $1 bill. Then my last one, since we're talking about silver, this is the 1964 Kennedy Silver Half Dollar. And again, this is the last uh, full 100% silver half dollar. Uh, they did produce a few of them in the following years that were like 40% silver. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one, even though it has a face value of 50 cents, it's actually worth closer to about $15 because of its silver content. And so I share all of these to start our discussion on whether or not this stuff can bring happiness. Because when you think about it, going back to the just standard $1 bill, we use this like a tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be probably unusual to collect it because it's so common. It's right. used for its instrumental value. But then suddenly as you get into silver certificates and silver coins and that... And the $2 bills. The $2 yeah. bills, as it becomes uh, rarer, uh, it almost takes on a different context where yeah. it still has instrumental value. We could still use these things to purchase other things, but they start to have a value in and of themselves. Right. And it turns from just using it to buy material things to more of an experience of sorts. And I think that's at the heart of what we want to talk about today. Um, so... You mentioned a little story with your daughter. Uh, I guess I'm curious, uh, in general, we have a relationship that develops with money. Mm -hmm. uh, how was money presented to you as a child? Was it a positive thing or a negative thing? Well, it was positive in terms of my own purchase power. So I was mm -hmm. given chores. I was given an allowance. I was taught, you know, the value of money. But... The, what was unspoken, I think, um, has struck me the most in my adulthood, and that was I have two incredible parents who worked so hard um, at their careers, yeah. but they never loved their work, and I knew that from a very young age. They would come home, and they weren't happy at what they were doing. They didn't mm, find any significant purpose or meaning, but they were providing for my little brother and I, and that was what was important to them. And so we went on vacations. We had everything provided that we needed, but I did see that my parents didn't necessarily love going to work. And so as a result, I had this belief that in order to make money that you needed to survive, you had to work and that might not be fun. And then as an adult, I made the choice, well, I wanna love what I do. I wanna find yeah. purpose and meaning in my career. And so I went into the nonprofit sector, which interestingly enough, um, is notorious for people not, not making, making a lot of money. Yep. But I thought, isn't it more important to love what I'm doing and invest what I'm into what I'm doing so that I have fulfillment and meaning. But it's interesting that you felt that was a choice. It was one or the other. I thought it was a choice right. until there was a shift in my relationship with money and with career when I thought, oh, wait, why does it have to be one or the other? Mm -hmm. I could find purpose and I could get the money and the earnings that I need to live the life that I want to live with my family and provide for my children and go on those vacations. But until that shift took place in my own mind and in my relationship with the money, I lived paycheck to paycheck thinking, well, I traded the salary 
for the purpose and meaning. So hmm. I found that interesting. That is interesting. And you know, and I went through something probably similar uh, when I was first going to college, I went for philosophy. Mm -hmm. Philosophy, again, was notorious for uh, having this reputation that you probably wouldn't work at all, but if you did, you weren't going to work for a lot of money. Yeah. And so I had taken a philosophy of law class and absolutely loved it. Well, lawyers make money. Right. And so and instantly I thought, well, okay, I really like what I'm doing in philosophy, but I think I'll also go to law school. And that was actually my motivation to become a lawyer initially was that'll put food on the table mm -hmm. so that I can do what I love in philosophy. And ironically, um, I did practice law for over a decade uh, mm -hmm. in the Midwest, and now I still do consulting and that. But law has always been, with the exception of about 10 years of my life, the secondary income for me. Mm -hmm. It's always been kind of the backdrop that I never was unemployed in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it is the passion of doing what you love mm -hmm. comes through. Absolutely, and when you do what you love, of course the earnings are gonna come because you're gonna be good at it. But I remember when I was working on my MBA, some people said, why are you doing this to go into the nonprofit sector? And yeah. I thought, because that's where my heart is. My heart is in the nonprofit right. sector. And yet there is this perception that people who work for nonprofit organizations are struggling financially. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have to be the case, but that's a belief that we hold. And so it's interesting to me the beliefs that we take on, that we adopt. And again, this was nothing that was spoken to me as a child. This was just my observations of the world around me. And then I took that on for myself. Yeah, and I have to admit, yeah. I, I, now we, it was actually spoken. We heard many times growing up, you can't buy happiness. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go to work, but work wasn't equated with happiness. Work, by its very definition, is something you're probably not going to be happy at. Right. But it's a necessary evil, so mm -hmm. to speak, so that you can do the things with your family and your loved mm -hmm. ones that you want to do that will bring you happiness. Yeah. And they really were handled almost like exclusive categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that my experience with work has been the opposite of that, that I, uh, I've held some jobs I enjoyed more than others, um, but I have also walked off of very high-paying jobs for less lower-paying jobs because I like the lifestyle yeah. that it brought holistically, and mm -hmm. it wasn't about just the dollar amount. And that's important, and it's mm -hmm. always been important to me that my children see me happy in what I'm doing. the behavior all yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, and it reminds me of an ancient Greek philosopher, Diogenes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's, I have it just now. Okay, he's not one of the more popular ones. Usually it's uh, Socrates or Plato or Aristotle. Uh, but Diogenes was an interesting character. Uh, his father minted currency. Mm -hmm. And Diogenes never followed in his father's footsteps. Uh, instead, he was actually quite critical of what was the beginning of a consumeristic society developing. Um, he felt that we should return to the more simplistic uh, styles that nature offered us mm -hmm. models of. And so he would debase money on a regular basis. And because of that, his original hometown was a town called Sinope. He was banished from Sinope, which today would be in Turkey, uh, to give you okay. a geographic location. Yep. Uh, so he was banished, and he wasn't allowed to return. And so he headed to Athens, and it's in Athens that we end up learning a lot about Diogenes mm -hmm. because the Athenians were, well, they prided themselves with being the cultural hub of their time period. So they uh, captured a lot of the stories. And to give you a little background on Diogenes, um, this is someone who pretty much gave up his material possessions when he moved to Athens. He did have a wooden bowl. Um, we know about the wooden bowl because he ends up eventually giving that up as well. Uh, he lived in a clay pot in the marketplace. Uh, where, again, very visible, because they would come daily. They didn't have mm -hmm. the refrigeration systems and that, so the marketplace became the general hub. Uh, he was known for carrying a lit lantern around during the day. And when people would ask him, he's like, why do you have a lantern? He's like, well, I'm on a search for an honest person. You know, and so That's he was great. a very eccentric character, yeah, to, say yeah, to say right. the least. Yeah, to say the least. But what I do find fascinating, like with the wooden bowl, he one day sees a young peasant boy drinking out of the river, just using his hands, you know, cupping the water. Yeah. And he makes this pronounced, uh, now famous quote that, uh, you know, I can't believe it. I've been living so superfluously, yeah. you know, with all this extra bowl. baggage. Yeah. And so he gets rid of his wooden bowl. <laughs> so this is one possession. That's great. Um, but it's an interesting lesson 
I think yeah. that Diogene uh, puts forward in front of us this question of to what extent do we as human beings create our own unhappiness? You know, yeah. by creating yeah. this desire to want things that we don't really yeah. need or even want. Right, and we're always it, looking for more. There. Right. right. And we have that conversation at home, the difference between a need and something we want or desire. And right. again, I mean, I don't want to go extreme on this. Right. I don't want to live in a clay pot down on Main sure. Street. Although, you know, yeah. during the summer, it's probably not so bad. You have yeah. the concerts on the town right. square, and it'd be all right. Winter, a little more challenging. For sure. Um, but I think it is a valuable lesson in challenging ourselves to think about, but what is that point of, yeah. and again, the I balance. don't know that I would draw that distinction between needs and wants. Um, mm -hmm. I hear that a lot, but... If we're thinking about happiness and a true fulfilling life, mm -hmm. some people will be very satisfied with just having needs met. Wants, however, I don't view as a, a negative or any way evil thing. Oh, it's when no. they're out of balance. When, when you talk we're about out of balance, it gets excessive. Exactly. You know, so. But when you need the sweater, Mama, I need right. it. Do you really need it, or do you have thirty sweaters in your closet at home? Or do you just really want it? Well, and, and when okay you think want. about why you feel you want that, so yeah, because it's usually not about the sweater. No, and so that's not. where we get into right. well, what is it I'm really feeling is lacking in my right. life right. by buying that sweater? Right, and am I really filling that void with that right. sweater? Right. What is causing that void? Or as Diogenes would say, am I digging a deeper void? Right, you know, the, yeah. by wanting, placing all yeah. these wants where they really yeah. weren't before. Well, interestingly enough, I was at a conference last week, as you know, and there was a young college student involved in the AmeriCorps program, and he was up as a panel member speaking in front of the conference. And he said, I'm very hopeful for our future, but the one thing that terrifies me is when we put profit over people. And I thought, mm. wow, that's really interesting. And I'm talking about money with Maria on Monday, so I have to remember <laughs> that. But it, it's interesting because we use this tool, but what happens when this tool becomes something more? Well, you hit at the fact that there's not an endless supply of stuff. Yeah. And so suddenly, if we have to fight over whether it's a need or a want, the mm. material things to fulfill that it does start to pit human beings yes. against each other. Yes. Um, so yeah. let's talk a little bit yeah, about the so, research. Yes, what does the research say about does money buy happiness? Okay, because so we've learned growing up. I heard over and over again. Money is it evil. It cannot buy happiness. Yeah. It's, well, okay, I'll give you my first my good lawyer response. Okay. It depends. <laughs> That's the response you can give to just about okay. it. It depends. That's great. But it really applies here um, mm -hmm. because the answer is not as simple as saying yes or no. Uh, what we find is, in the research, when it comes to currency or money, we have to look at it two different ways. Uh, first, if we talk about the quantity of money, how much money I make. Uh, the research seems to show that there is a point to which, if you're increasing your paycheck, you will have a direct correlation with an increased level mm -hmm. of happiness, but only up to a certain point. Um, most of the research settles that today in the United States around $75,000 annual salary. Mm -hmm. uh, some go as high as $80,000. We'll use the $75,000 figure for and our purpose. And that's correlated then to your ability to pay your bills and live in the house. And, and a little bit more than that, okay. the wants. So just so we understand first what that means when we say it's mm -hmm. correlated, it's kind of like if I have... Uh, an increase in my paycheck, the number is going up. And mm -hmm. let's say this hand is uh, how happy I feel. For a while, this is going to happen. You know, I sure. see a bigger number on my yeah. paycheck, it's going up, my level of happiness is spiking. Mm -hmm. But eventually, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and your level of happiness isn't going to directly correlate. It may still go up, but it's going to start to plateau, and eventually it won't go up just because the paycheck's going Because you going can up. pay your bills comfortably. You can go on the vacation. You, you can, can do buy. basically the things you want to do. But after yeah. that, Well, and when you think about up. buying things, it's sort of like developing an addiction. Right. You know, that first car I buy... It can be a clunker, yeah. and I have a spike in happiness. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's my first vehicle. My 1985 Toyota Camry. <laughs> and, and, but notice <laughs> what it's buying you, though. It's not really freedom. just that thing. It's yeah, the freedom. It's buying you freedom. And then suddenly, 
you kind of want your freedom to be a little more reliable, so you want to step up the vehicle. Yeah. So it makes sense as we're stepping you want up more initially. Than a tape deck there you go. An AM, FM radio, dial radio. But at what point is the car enough? Yeah. And that's where we see. By the time you're buying your fifth, your sixth vehicle, and especially if you buy the same vehicle, the spike in happiness is going to alter. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not mm -hmm. going to see that same reward. Uh, mm -hmm. Do I need two vehicles? Do I need three, four? You know, eventually mm -hmm. it plateaus because right. the stuff can't feed mm -hmm. um, what I need Going as an back individual. to what is that void. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if we're approaching happiness based upon making more money, it's not a sustainable model. Mm -hmm. It'll work for a while, and that's what makes it attractive. And this is why uh, I always challenge my college students to set their success number. You know, because most of them will admit at least one of the reasons, if not the driving reason, why they're in college. They want a good job that's going to pay yeah. more money than what they're able to make right now. Right. And that makes sense, sure. you know, because they're not at that $75,000 mm -hmm. mark yet. When, again, that's a rough estimate. It'll vary a little per mm -hmm. person. But if you set your actual success mark, you know, okay, if I want to make more money, I can't ever attain that because mm -hmm. there's always more. Right. But if I say I want to eventually have a job that pays $80,000, mm -hmm. $100,000, I mean, you set it something that is your success, then you know when you've attained that goal yeah. and you also realize you're going to have to look for something else at that point because just mm -hmm. attaining more money isn't going to necessarily make us happier. Right. I mean, you might have heard of the various research with the lottery winners. Sure. You know, absolutely. some are happy, some are devastated. Yeah, right. You know, it's the same thing. How are they using the money uh, once yeah. they, they so win that lottery? So how we spend our money matters. It matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, and there's a complexity to how our societies operate, especially we're in a consumeristic society. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as just having the money to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mentioned the lottery winners. Uh, it's probably worth discussing them a little bit. Uh, there's more to it than simply what I buy materialistically uh, with the, those lottery, like I win millions. There's a mindset that goes with money. Uh, and um, one way of thinking about this, and I, I actually heard this at a presentation mm -hmm. once, and I thought it was a fascinating way to view the economic classes. Mm -hmm. Because we tend to think of like the impoverished class according to a dollar amount, and middle class, and upper class, uh, that we even have these estimates as mm -hmm. to when do you click into that. A lot of it's driven by our tax laws. Right. You know, uh, but if you think about it, there's so much more to these like economic class associations mm -hmm. than just a dollar right. amount. And there are mindsets associated. There's direct mindsets. Yeah. So if you think about, like, you have your cup of coffee with you today, so mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. If we're going to just use a really particular example of using money to buy food, mm -hmm. if I'm in that impoverished class, uh, I am looking at quantity. How much yeah. food? Because I'm right. hungry. Right. I just want to fill my stomach. Yeah. But if I move to the middle class, now I have the money to have mm -hmm. enough food so mm -hmm. I'm not hungry. So, so I start you're, thinking you're about... choosing, selecting which Which foods. kinds of food. Yeah. The, the yeah. taste of it. Right. The healthiness right. of it. You know, mm -hmm. interestingly, five-star restaurants are mostly middle class. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's yeah, not what well, we think of the upper class, yeah. the perception of it. Ruby Payne did a lot of work on this. And yes. the book, uh, Framework for Understanding Poverty, is a really wonderful resource talking about the mindset of the classes. Yeah, and, you know, I remember my grandmother who lived through the Depression would, and she, of course, didn't need to, but she would dry out her paper towels after using them to save yeah. My mom had a lot yeah. of those things that she does because, again, she was a child during the Depression yeah. and remembers those days. Mm -hmm. But interesting with this food analogy, if you get to the upper class, it's not even about the food anymore. Right. It's presentation because yeah. they have plenty of money for the quantity. They have plenty yeah. of money to buy the good-tasting food. Yeah. So it becomes how you present it and the unique experience of the food, the which is the second part of the research. We've been talking about the quantity. Yeah. But the more important part is the experience that we buy mm -hmm. with our money. Mm -hmm. um, what we do find is, regardless of how much money we have, uh, if we're using our money to purchase experiences rather than material things, we have a higher level reported uh, mm -hmm. level of happiness. So the family vacation is a great investment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to buy things, if you buy them attached to experiences, 
uh, that mm -hmm. you have. In fact, I yeah. brought you a philosopher here. This, again, is probably not a real well-known philosopher. He's an Italian philosopher. Do you recognize mm -hmm. him at all? Well, you taught me about him already. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember his name? before. I do not. Okay. So I ask. Salvador Rosa. Yeah. Okay. He's an Italian philosopher. He, well, he's actually an artist first, but I, I, I always preface the philosophy for him. And there's a little Latin yeah. phrase down here that I absolutely love where it says, be quiet unless what you have to say is more important than silence. It's like, oh, that is a real, yes, a great lesson. But the reason I bring this is this is a painting, well, it's actually a print of an original painting that's hung in the National Gallery in London mm -hmm. uh, right now. And I could have just purchased this online. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could have bought it, purchased it online. I didn't. I actually went to London. Uh, it's when I discovered him. Uh, as an artist and a philosopher. Uh, I was on a study abroad trip with a colleague of mine. Uh, we had uh, about 18 philosophy students, mm -hmm. and we were in the National Gallery. And my colleague, uh, his name's Mark Thorsby, he's a colleague from Texas, we had this wonderful conversation. Neither of us had heard of him before this, so we followed it up with research. I bought the print there, but had it shipped back so I didn't have to carry it all the way. <laughs> And even though it would have been easy to just go online and purchase it, now this object has all these memories yeah, attached it's to it. part of that experience. Right. Yeah. And it's a, probably a good valuable lesson for us to think about when we go on our family vacations. You mm -hmm. know, choose your trinkets carefully yeah. because they can actually have this deep meaning right. with the experiences mm -hmm. And every you time enjoy. you look at that item it brings back those memories, those exactly. happy feelings. Exactly. Yeah. And that really is the type of home to build, like mm -hmm. where you go into your home and everywhere you look, it's these memories yes. of great experiences. What a wonderful way to spend your oh, money. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. On my dresser, I have a jar of sand from our honeymoon. And every morning when I look at that jar, I think, oh, way back when, you know, 14 years ago. But what a happy memory that was for me. And one of the first things I look at. It brings it all yeah. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. brings it all back. So uh, in conclusion, uh, when we think about the question of can money buy happiness, uh, the answer is really twofold. Uh, yes, it can in quantity, how much money you make, up to roughly about $75,000 a year. Uh, you'll see a direct correlation to an increase in happiness. Uh, but probably the better recommended approach in life, use your money to buy experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, time with friends, time with family, and it's a much more sustainable usage Building of money. Building those memories, yeah.